Hey folks, in today's episode, we have New York Times bestselling author, Tucker Max, who over the last few years has gotten into plant medicine, written extensively about his journey on Medium, and is currently working on a couple undisclosed projects related to psychedelics. Welcome to the Third Wave Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Austin, here to bring you cutting edge interviews with leading scientists, entrepreneurs, and medical professionals who are exploring how we can integrate psychedelics in an intentional and responsible way for both healing and transformation. It is my honor and privilege to bring you these episodes as you get deeper and deeper into why these medicines are so critical to the future of humanity. So let's go and let's see what we can explore and learn together in this incredibly important time. This podcast is brought to you by Sovereignty. They blend ancient Eastern plant medicine with highly functional bioavailable cannabinoids. This is by far the best nootropic supplement that I've worked with in recent memory. You know, I've cycled through probably 12 to 15 different supplements specifically for sleep because I have a hard time winding down at night. And I also wear the Aura Ring, so it tests and measures my sleep quality. And since I started working with Dream, which is one of the two supplements that Sovereignty offers, my Aura Ring sleep score has increased consistently and I've woken up feeling a lot more refreshed and ready to go. So they have two different supplements. One is Purpose, that's great for daytime alertness and focus, and it includes seven plant-based ingredients. And what I just mentioned is Dream, which is meant for nighttime relaxation and rest, restorative and rejuvenating sleep with CBN. And not only my personal example, but Sovereignty tested it on hundreds of people with aura rings and found that 76% of people had improved sleep in some capacity. So if you're interested in finding out more about Sovereignty, for our listeners, they have your favorite money-back guarantee. If you purchase Sovereignty Supplements and you don't like it, and it's not the best supplement that you've ever had, they will not only replace your money, but they will also purchase your supplement of choice. So you can go and find out more information at Sovereignty.co backslash third wave. That is S-O-V-E-R-E-I-G-N-T-Y dot C-O backslash third wave. Third Wave's podcast is brought to you by Magic Mind, called Silicon Valley's New Morning Elixir by Forbes. Do you want more creativity, flow, and energy in your day-to-day -day routine? Then go to magicmind.co and get the two-ounce shot that contains 12 magical ingredients scientifically designed to improve your productivity. I've been using Magic Mind over the last couple months to reduce my morning coffee, and it works like a charm. With matcha, lion's mane, and several other nootropics, it lifts you up and doesn't burn you out. So if you're interested in Magic Mind, go to magicmind.co and enter promo code THIRDWAVE to get 10% off your first order. Tucker Max, man. So my first memory of Tucker Max, which I get into in the episode, was in college, which was about 10 years ago now. I'm 30 at this point in time. So when I was 19 or 20, around the same time that I started taking psychedelics, I also happened to be in a fraternity. And this was sort of a local fraternity. You know, it was at the small liberal arts school that I went to in Michigan called Hope College. We were the Cosmopolitan Fraternity, the Cosmos for short. And we were known as a fraternity for being, you know, the pot smokers, the, the kids who would go out to the woods and... You know, on the seminar day that we would do every year, you know, everyone would go and go to the special seminar and we'd go take mushrooms and hike around the woods for six or seven hours. You know, we also had fraternity stuff, alcohol culture and parties and, and things of that nature, but there was a softer side to us as well. Anyway, we would do these weekly meetings every Monday, I think it was, in the basement of our fraternity cottage. And at that point, this would have been 2009, 2010, Tucker Max had recently published I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell, which was a New York Times number one bestseller and made the bestseller list each year from 2006 to 2012. And it was essentially this hilarious, totally not PC book about his escapades with alcohol and women is a short way of putting that. They're hilarious and again, totally not PC. And I'm not encouraging or recommending it, just saying it's a funny fucking book. So we had that read. I've known of Tucker Max for a long time. And then recently within the last probably six months, he slid into my DMs. I'm on Twitter and just doing whatever. And then all of a sudden, boom, I get a DM from Tucker. Hey, dude, 
saw your podcast, Love Third Wave, would love to chat with you about some things because I've been working on some psychedelic projects. About a year before that, you know, I had seen some of the posts that he had done on Medium, which we will post in the show notes, about how to get started with plant medicine therapy and Tucker's own journey with MDMA medicine. And if any of you have read Tucker's earlier work, you can only imagine sort of the cognitive dissonance in going from writing a book like They Hope I Serve Beer in Hell to publicly acknowledging and even jellicalizing, is that even a word? Psychedelic medicine. And the way that Tucker has written about it in those two Medium posts, I now use those as core reference materials to anyone who wants to get started because they're really that good. So I had a chance back in July of this year to go to Austin, Texas for the first time. Tucker lives on the outskirts of Austin. So I ended up reaching out to him. We set up a time to sit down at his place and just sat down and talked for like an hour and a half, drinking bottles of San Pellegrino uh, and vibing on a number of levels. You know, we all have different parts of our identity. Part of my identity is sort of the fraternity bro element. And so Tucker and I really kind of dug into a lot of interesting topics in this episode. Super long form, a little bit longer than normal, but he's a brilliant dude. And I feel like you guys will really, really enjoy us because he's also fucking hilarious. And the place that we recorded it in, it's like a library. It's his office, literally probably like anywhere from two to 3,000 books. And I just walked in there and was totally in heaven. So great set and setting for an interview, really insightful stuff. And I won't say anything further. I just want to bring you right into this magical, magical conversation. So without any further ado, I bring you Tucker Max. What's your typical drug intake like? Are you like caffeine, tobacco, cannabis? I mean, we talk about MDMA and like it produces psychedelic. I don't use caffeine anymore. Hardly ever. Like Mm -hmm. I'll drink a little bit of tea or kombucha. I'm not like a weirdo about it, Mm -hmm. but like I don't know coffee. Um, and very little tea. Like uh, the stuff I drink in the morning, I use cacao shells, mm-hmm. uh, which is like a, like a type of tea. And then I put in like cocoa powder, like uh, cinnamon, vanilla, shaga, lion's mane, like a few more things like that. Those type of things. I put in glycine for sweetness. Mm-hmm. It tastes kind of like thin hot chocolate. You would never think of it as like, this is the best hot chocolate I've ever had, but it's pretty good. It gets you up, but it's not a stimulant. You know, I've never really been a nicotine person or any sort of tobacco. I can't stand smoking anything. I've never really done pot or cannabis at all. Really? Never? Never. (laughs) It's definitely one of those things where like I associated that substance with losers, you know, like for me growing up, right? I have no problem if anyone wants to do it or anything like that. So I never did it growing up, but I feel like it's one of those things where you don't tend to get into pot when you're like 38 or something. It just doesn't make sense. And honestly, man, the times that I do it, I just get tired. Mm-hmm. Like I just like either get paranoid or get tired. I don't. And everyone's like, no, you got to try different strains. I'm like, I tried all the fucking strains, man. <laughs> Nothing like that. No, seriously, like weeks in Boulder I spent like for something else. And like uh, sativa and uh, uh, what's the indigo or whatever the other one is. And uh, I don't know. I tried them all. They were all felt the same to me. They don't do much for me. Caffeine used to be a big part, but actually it didn't until I was about 31, 32. And then I stopped drinking coffee at like 38, 39. So there's only less than a decade there. For me now, it's just, I only take substances medicinally, like therapeutically. That's it. Like, so whether it's MDMA or LSD or mushrooms or ketamine or whatever it is, it's only therapeutically. No, what about alcohol? Because I mean, so oh, much. Of, yeah, well, of course. So much of like, I hope they serve beer and hell, and like, kind of your pre the pre psychedelic Tucker Max. So you can find like booze galore, right? You, you know? can find hard alcohol in this house if you look. Okay, there's not much though, and the reason that there's any at all is because I invested in Deep Eddie, you know, mm-hmm. like the flavored vodka company, which mm-hmm. sold for almost five hundred million to Heaven Hill, paid for this house, right? more than paid for the house and so like uh that's the only hard liquor i have other than like a few random bottles of scotch people send me and i'm allergic to whiskey so it's like thank you you don't know me at all and, uh, i do have a wine cellar it is the only thing in the house insured like it's the house itself and the wine cellar and nothing other i guess the cars because you have to it's an obnoxiously good wine cellar so my wife and i really like wine and we probably drink twice a week Maybe. And, you know, like we'll open a bottle of wine, usually don't finish it. Like that's why we like that people over for dinner 
because like the two of us are not drinking a whole bottle together. It's like about four glasses per bottle. So if we have another couple or someone else over, then we can finish you know, a bottle or two bottles or whatever. It's more of a social thing. Mm-hmm. But like she'll drink a half a glass of wine and I'll drink a glass of wine. And then it's like, and we have really expensive wines. So it's like, we can't be open to $500 bottles and throw in half yeah. out. That's just not like, I'm doing well, but it's that's like just basically illegal. At that that, point. That's, that's like Roman emperor obnoxious rich. Yeah. And like, we're, you're not even being rich anymore. You're just being an asshole. You know, kind of like drinking San Pellegrino. No, out well, full, I mean, out of the dude, full bottle like this. I love these. Oh, I used course. to do this back in, in college. Amazing. I would just take one. I played soccer, and I was known as the guy in the back of the bus. You could afford San Pellegrino in college with a full bottle. Of Fuck off! I couldn't afford it. <laughs> no, you know what's crazy about this is San Pellegrino. It's cheaper than the stuff they make in America. The stuff in Arkansas. I can't remember what it's called. The, Mountain Spring or whatever. Yeah, not Mountain Spring. It's like a uh, uh, Wash- or something. Oh, okay. um, like it's like a dollar and a half less per bottle and it's better like and it's cheaper than Gerald Steiner which is the German one it's I love, really I cheap I love the German one I love the, the German one's one. good I swear to you the Italians must subsidize this or something because it's like a dollar fifty a bottle or something it's obnoxiously cheap it's like the same price as the Whole Foods right like right it's the same one. price as the shit from Mexico like uh, Topo Chica Topo Chica <laughs> It's basically the same price as Topo That's Chico. all over Austin. I was I was I was hopping around taco stands yesterday. I'm like, Topo Chico's. Everywhere. It takes a special kind of dumbass hipster to import water from Mexico. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. We're going to import water from Mexico. No, that's fucking stupid. But it is huge in Austin. Yeah. I mean, it's fine, but it's not even good carbonated water. It's like. They just take whatever, normal water, and they just cram CO2 in it. So it's got these huge bubbles, and it, like you burp like a fucking Viking on it. Whereas like San Pellegrino, it's got like nice little thin, delicate bubbles. It's, it's, it's Italian. Like, it, it's dude, Italian. It's, you know? it's, they do things well. They're, it's got a good they're, they're flavor. sophisticated. Yeah. With food, they are. With food and cars, design, anything like that. They're like the Japanese. They, mm-hmm. they nail that shit. So you live in Austin. How long have you been in Austin for? A decade. More than a decade. Oh, so you were here before. It was 2009. Cool. Or just when it was becoming cool. Yeah, it was starting to become pretty cool. I like I was early on, it was maybe eight hundred thousand when I got here, mm-hmm. and now it's like two million or something like that. Austin's like the eleventh biggest city in America now. It's I know, dude. It's crazy. It's crazy how big it is. Because so, all these people from, from San Francisco and like the tech California world have moved over here. Now a bunch of friends who are in New York. I think it'll just become Joe Rogan, I heard his movie. No, really? Yeah, he just announced this on on the podcast. Uh, earlier this week, but he's going to really? move here. Peter Atia is moving to Austin. Oh, wow. who else? Like a like a handful of other people are, are like coming to Austin. Rogan. Austin's a spot. Yeah, Rogan. Rogan's as Rogan. LA as it gets. I know things are changing. Wow. Yeah, I mean, who wants to be in California? California is a failed state, man. Yeah. California is a failed state. As beautiful as it is, and the weather and blah blah blah, it is a failed state, dude. I, I would like my wife and I can live anywhere, and we picked. Uh, we met here, so we didn't pick it together, but we decided to stay here. Texas, I think, is the best place to live. It's one of three or four of the best places to live in America for the next 40 years. You think that? No doubt. Why is that? Well, I mean, dude, look around. The world is going through... Well, let's just stay with America, even though it's true for the world. You know, different stages, places in the world are different stages of enlightenment and consciousness. America is going through a very turbulent stage. It started years ago, but now it's people are starting to really realize it. I'm pretty confident that America is going to, if not literally, then functionally break apart. Mm-hmm. And if that happens, there's a lot of ways it could happen. Like if Trump gets elected, it'll probably happen in a different way than if Biden gets elected or whoever. I don't think he's going to be the nominee, but whatever. Um, uh, uh, there's no better place than Texas. You got to always start with geography and fundamentals, right? Mm -hmm. So in America, there's three power grids. There's the Western power grid, the Eastern power grid, and there's Texas. Texas has its own power grid. Does it really? Dead serious. Its own power grid. We are energy self-sufficient. We are effectively manufacturing self-sufficient, not literally, of course, but we could be. We're nearly resource self-sufficient, food self-sufficient. We can be. Either we are or we can be in all of these things. As a voting populace in the state, it's got the right balance between not crazy, redneck, racist, awful, but not wokest, cult, crazy either, right? Right. Yeah, right? They're not canceling. All the bullshit that's going on right it, now. It's um, neither. It, it's got, the, in a lot of ways, the best elements of both. Mm-hmm. I think it is the also the only state, whether this uh, gets respected or not is a different political discussion, but it's the only state that can legally secede from the union. It's in the, the charter, like... 
Texas is part of becoming America, can, the state itself can vote, and I forget if it's two thirds, but can vote itself out of the union because of its history and how it was it, it's the, been, it's the it was only state that's ever been its own country, and, right? Yeah. There's a huge movement called the One Republic. I think it's called One Republic or Texas Republic Movement or something like that. Uh, people it like like 15 years ago, it had like it was like 20 crazy people, right? And now it's like five million. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. I don't know if Texas is going to secede. I don't see that happening. Something is going to happen where the federal government is going to essentially become a hollow state. And depending where you are, it's going to be really painful. Like if you're in New York, I would not want to be in New York or California. And not because of like California geographically and resource wise is fantastic. But governance wise is it's as bad as it gets in the Western world. Like I could not imagine having to deal with that. Whereas in Texas, no state income tax. When I first moved here, I'll never forget this. I remember walking around town like, right? You know, and it's like beautiful. All these people, uh, everyone's fit running or hiking, doing cool outdoor stuff. And I'm like, but they all have fanny packs. I'm like, what losers, right? This is in 09. Like, why the hell would all these losers have fanny packs? And I asked my friend, I'm like, like, everything seems so cool about Austin, but like, you guys are like, have these weird fashion things. You're like 20 years behind. Everyone has fanny packs. <laughs> he looks at me, he goes, you're an idiot. He goes, look at them next time. Look at the way that they're sitting. I'm like, why? He's like, they're guns. <laughs> like, no. He's like, yeah. And then you actually look and it's like, oh, it looks like they have a bag of rocks in their a fanny pack. Everyone's packing. It's like, oh, shit. And like, I, so I grew up with guns hunting. I have no problem with it. Like, I don't carry guns around. At least I didn't before because we're in America. Why would you need to? Shit changes. But anyway, so two days or two weeks after I got here, I'll never forget this. This rabid, literally a rabid dog got loose downtown. Four people shot at it and missed before the like a sheriff took it down. <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing because first off, it's like everyone has a gun. Yeah. No one really knows how to use it, but everyone has it, right? And so, like, that's another thing where it's like I'm a big believer in the founding fathers. Uh, certain ideas of the founding fathers, like holding slaves, maybe not so much. Armed, right to bear arms. Uh, right to bear arms. Ar armed <clears throat> populace, big fan as the ultimate check on government power. And the ultimate sense of responsibility, like you have in your hand a something that can kill you or other people. So you need to be responsible, learn how to use it and all that kind of stuff. That was one of those things where I was like, oh, this is like, this is a good place. This is a place where people take responsibility for themselves, understand and care about sovereignty and can actually back that stuff. Well, I think, and that's the big thing. It's like individual sovereignty. Uh -huh. that's, that's what I keep coming back to. And what's so interesting about your story, you know, we talked about this. We had recorded a podcast a couple months ago. Right. I didn't realize after the fact that I sounded like a squeaky mouse. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, you never like, I like listened to when I was going, I was like, what was wrong with my audio? It was, it was terrible. You sounded fine to me. Dude. Okay. It, okay, must okay. Recording it, it must have been the recording. So we got into this a little bit, but I think, you know, one of the things with psychedelics that a lot of people talk about is like, you know, they were used in the 60s and 70s, how it's all love, how it's all openness, you know, and I even been reading, you know, you've been sending out these really interesting tweets, like right. two or three tweets a day, which are like, sort of unraveling your own onion and self awareness mm -hmm. and development as you're like, oh, realizing that like my projection is actually X, Y, and Z, blah, 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 blah. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on like, individual sovereignty, everyone carrying guns, Texas, independent republic, and then like, Psychedelic medicine and healing and love and compassion, like so, because uh, they all come down in my mind. They all come down to personal responsibility, right? I was born in '75, so like I don't give a fuck about the '60s. My parents were children of the '60s. They were not boomers, and in my experience, the boomers are the dumbest generation of narcissists the world has ever seen. At least I've ever seen. That's quite right. Do you know any of them? It only takes a few, because obviously not every single one. You can't say any generation of anyone is anything. Sure. The overwhelming majority of boomers that I know are just so, even the good ones are so fucking, they're just less narcissistic than the others, right? So clearly something was fucked with that generation. And it makes a lot of sense. The, I, I grew up, like my grandparents or, or their parents, that was the greatest generation. That was probably the most disconnected group of people in American history. Because think about it. They were raised during the Depression. 
came of age and had to fight Hitler. Right? <laughs> so I get that they didn't really feel a lot of them. Everything was trauma for them for their whole fucking life. Everything. Right. I get it. Okay. Right. It makes it, you're born actually, you're born really in world war one. You grow up during the depression and then you become an adult and have to go fight to stop Hitler. Sucks. They don't know how to connect with themselves. They raise uh, a bunch of kids who come up in the, the consumerist boom that become the dumbest narcissists in the generation that we've ever seen. It makes sense. I get it. Okay. So why am I talking about that? Because I think most people's impressions of psychedelics come from that generation. I know mine did. But then once I experienced them, I was like, this has nothing to do with the 60s and with those ideas. I don't want to say nothing to do with any of the ideas. But like, think about the people who popularized a lot of the psychedelics. Not Terrence McKenna. Who are the ones everyone knows? Timothy Leary. Um, Ram Dass. Ram mm-hmm. Dass, right? Timothy Leary. Ram Dass is actually like not that bad. But like Timothy Leary, uh, what's it? William S. Burroughs. Mm-hmm. Jack Kerouac, these were the most irresponsible motherfuckers you could imagine. The Bohemian Beach. Oh, dude, they were so irresponsible. And they're so romanticized. And they were fucking punks. They were punks and bitches. And I mean that like in all the worst ways, right? They were the most irresponsible is the word I keep coming back to because I can't reckless. And not in funny ways. They were just destructive, right? God, even ones like Hunter S. Thompson, who's like a better version was still incredibly reckless and destructive. And look, I kind of get where they were coming from. I don't know any of them, but knowing their grandparents or their parents who were my grandparents, I probably would have acted the same way, man. Like, I don't even kind of blame them. All the greatest, greatest generation I knew were pretty awful people in a lot of ways, right? And mainly because they were completely disconnected from themselves. And so they just dumped all their shit on everyone else. First time I took psychedelics, I was 40... 41 or 42. And I was like, oh, dude, I got it totally wrong. All my impressions of this were based on secondhand knowledge. And now once I did it, okay, now I understand what Terrence McKenna was saying when he's like, this is completely experiential and you can't talk about it. Like, you can't explain it. You just have to do it. And then the first thing that hit was love. Love for everyone and everything. And then the connectedness of all of it and the oneness. I get, those two things are very intertwined, at least for me. And I think the concepts are very intertwined. They're not the same thing, very intertwined. But then the thing that flows off of that, the weird thing is the responsibility, right? Because like, for some reason, somehow, the idea that love and oneness meant lack of responsibility, I don't know where that came from. But like, I see it as the opposite, right? Because we're all connected, I don't exist alone. Uh, like we know, the experiment's been run. We know what happens when humans are raised without contact with other humans. They're not human right? They're primal animals because humans are networked beings and and we negotiate our reality and we understand reality off of each other. And so what that means is we're not just responsible for ourselves. You can argue obligation, all that sort of shit. At a minimum, I am not just responsible to myself. I'm responsible to others, at least insofar as how I act to them, Mm -hmm. right? Number one. And then number two, I realized the other big shattering thing with psychedelics for me was realizing, oh, dude, I get to essentially create my own reality. Not literally, right? Because I don't get to create this table or something. There are still rules that you have to follow. And there's like gravity. You've gone on very deep trips, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Like, there are rules. I think the only reason we can't break the rules is because we don't know how. Well, first off, if you understand physics, and I mean modern quantum physics, like most of what people think of reality is just made up is the wrong word. It is one construction of reality that is true in a certain way, but you go a little bit outside of those bounds and it breaks down, like Newtonian physics, which is what most people think of as physics. You drop the ball, it falls, gravity, all that kind of stuff. It got us to the moon, right? It works in a certain bound, but as soon as you start looking deeper at energy and particles, all of it breaks down. None of it applies, none of it. And the more research is done into subatomic particles, the more it looks like all the kooks who talk about manifestation and creating, like it looks like what they're saying is at least somewhat correct. Mm -hmm. Like it's directionally correct, right? Even if you don't believe the secret, like it's a dumb book, fine, but it is more directionally correct than objective, the notion of objective reality, right? And so once you understand all of that, it's all summed up by Einstein said in the twenties, the two big camps, let's call it objective reality physics, right? Led by Einstein 
And he basically said, I refuse to believe God plays dice with the universe, mm. right? Niels Bohr was quantum physics, and he said, don't tell God what to do with his dice. Mm. I was so fully in the relative of the Einstein camp until I did uh, psychedelics, and I was like, oh, he's wrong. Niels Bohr is totally right. I don't know how to explain it. I can't manipulate this table into, you know, an energy pulse with my mind or any sh stupid shit like that, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, wouldn't that be cool? You go to but, Hogwarts like, and uh, right. like, trade in some of the... Uh, and so anyway, what this means is so many people, I think, see themselves as either cogs in the machine or servants or low on a hierarchy. Once I did psychedelics, I realized that that's just not true, that every single one of us have immense power and whether we use it or not is essentially a choice mm -hmm. and that we are responsible for that choice. It is a choice. Dude, it was the craziest thing, man. I'm kind of rambling a little bit. It's almost hard to use words to talk about these concepts. It was the craziest fucking thing. I grew up going to an Episcopal church and I was like a choir boy. Episcopal is like Catholicism without the guilt and the shame, right? So it's just like a social, it's like a country club. Like, I didn't even know anyone believed any of that stuff until I was, like, 10. Like, because I thought we just went to socialize. I mean, I'm like, clearly this isn't true. There's some bad, like, I never see, like, I had a very empirical mind even as a kid. And anyway, so I think it was my first time on mushrooms. No, it was the first time on LSD. I was like, oh, this is what Jesus meant. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of heaven is within. This is what he's talking about. The whole fucking New Testament. This is everything he's talking about. I don't know if he ever did any psychedelics or not. Who knows? But some people can get there without this stuff, man. Some people are just tapped into that layer. He appeared to be tapped into that layer. I have that power in me. I'm not a god. What uh, Christians call God or, or Muslims call Allah, who people call universe or source. It's the same thing. And it is the essential, the unifying, whatever you want to call it, the unifying energy that binds us all, which if you study high school physics, you understand, oh, yeah, that's obviously true. That's the second law, first and second law of thermodynamics. Then it's like, oh, well, shit. Okay. And then you understand you get to essentially create your life. And I mean that almost literally, almost literal as I can be with that. It was crazy to me, man. And then from there, responsibility just flows naturally. It's like, oh, okay. Like, I'm responsible for my actions outside, but I'm also responsible... I'll tell you, um, one of my big LSC sessions, I saw, like, do you read the Tibetan Book of the Dead? Mm -hmm. Okay. I read it in college for a course. You know, they're very creative. This is a cool story. And I interpreted it and read it as a story in college. And then my first big, it was on the sofa, my first big LSD session. I did LSD, MDMA combined. And uh, I was like, oh, my God. This is, like, <laughs> it's like the whole fucking thing. Like, they were exactly right. Everything that we're energetic beings having a physical experience and like we have to come into physical experiences because that's how our energy evolves but we come in without any knowledge of everything and that's part of the point is you've got to figure this stuff out and then you've got to uh, uh, evolve but either you know you can do it in one life but it's really hard and then karma is real and past lives are essentially energetic sort of karma and like I, all of it it was like oh fuck i can't believe Fuck, it was all right there. These motherfuckers 5,000 years ago figured all this out. Well, and that's where these, these truths are like, you know, when we come to them, when, like when I did acid for the first time 10 years ago, or when you had your first psychedelic experience, or Terrence McKenna, whoever it is, we're like, oh, we recognize these truths that are fundamentally like old as shit. There's old right? as people. But Buddha said, um, like some, one of his disciples was like, how long has this been going on? And I remember he, his quote was, Right, his quote is recorded as if a, something like if a dove were to fly over this mountain with a silk scarf once a year, as long as it would take for that bird to wear this mountain down, it's been going longer. At first, I was like, what the fuck is this dude talking about? <laughs> right? When I heard that, and uh, then now I'm like, yeah, he's right. I get it. Like, it's so fucking weird, man. Like, I didn't think I was an old soul before. Like, nothing about me says that. But then, like, one of these sessions, I was like, oh, my God. I don't know if I'm an old soul or not, but I've been around a lot and done a lot of shit, and I saw it all. And this, dude, this all sounds crazy. It all sounds totally crazy, and I completely understand if you're listening to this and being like, okay, this dude's a nut. 
Uh, I get it. I would have. You're said, a total nut. Three, hey, you're a total three years nut. ago, I would have been like, "Yeah, what the fuck's wrong with him?" I would t- go do your own, have your own psychedelic experience, mm-hmm. and see. It's not that hard. Jesus' whole message was, "You don't need the church. You don't need any of this. Kingdom of heaven is within. We all have this power. We're all children of God." He's saying the exact same thing. Buddha was saying the same thing. Krishna was saying the same thing. Like, go down the list of all the great avatars, man. They all said the same thing, and now I get it. I had no connection to this before psychedelics. And now it's like, I'm 100% on board. Something I want to talk about are the two pieces that you wrote on Medium about. One was, I think, about your own MDMA therapy. Right. Where you said something along the lines of, you know, what the rich and wealthy are doing now. On their weekends. On the weekends. Everyone's going to be doing it. We'll be doing it in 10 years, Uh which I thought was such a good line. And then the post about plant medicine therapy. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like if I want to get started with plant medicine, Where therapy, do you start? Yeah. how do I start? And what I'd love for you to like, we'll link to those in the show notes, but yeah. I think, you know, one thing that's coming up for me is you're talking about God and psychedelic experiences and the seven bardos that you can go through and, you know, all this sort of mystical esoteric stuff, you know, from my experience, it can be hard to access those points until you've sort of you've dealt with your trauma, cleared the detritus. And yeah. so I'd love like, if you could explain to our listeners sort of the analogy that your MDMA therapist yeah. talked about when it came yeah, the to lotus the, the lotus flower. The lotus flower. Yeah. That's probably my, my favorite yeah. analogy to explain it's so good. like spiritual bypassing, the necessity of healing trauma, yep. why people who have been doing ayahuasca for 25 years keep doing ayahuasca. It's an every month, and progress. they haven't made any progress. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know? We're coming up on my two year anniversary the first time I did MDMA, which is actually breathtaking to me. Like, I kind of feel like a vet, even though compared to people like, even like you, I'm like, I'm still a babe in the woods, dude. But I've done a lot of medicine over the last two years. And I had a strong therapeutic background, so I was able to go faster than most. I got lucky. I had some really good experienced guides, like really three people who have been, all three of whom have been doing this the least amount for 10 years, the most for 30. And other, the one she's been... Yeah. Almost 30 years. She like she knows everybody. Like she knew, you know, Terrence McKenna. She's as old school in this shit. I mean, she was living in the West Village and whatever 30 years ago, right? And so she knows all these people. And so all of them basically told me the same thing. They uh, but she gave me a really good analogy, that, that lotus flower analogy. She said, think of your the practice, like your work as growing a lotus flower. And she said, like if it, when you start with a lotus flower, what do you start with? And I'm like, you start with a seed, right? And she's like, no, you're the seed. You need to start with the dirt first. Because I guess to grow a lotus flower, you've got to have the right kind of dirt with the right water and ratio and whatever. You can't just throw it anywhere and it grows. It's not it's a like, lotus flower. Right. It's, it's not a weed. It's very delicate, right? Yeah. Exactly. It's not a dandelion. Exactly. And so, and she's like, in this analogy, the dirt is MDMA, right? MDMA for most Westerners, people like, we live in a culture that you can't even realize how traumatizing our no. culture is until you start to heal. And then you're like, everything is fucked up and terrible. Like, <laughs> seriously, it's like being drunk all the time and then getting sober and then looking around like you've been sober to a college bar. It's like, this is the worst thing ever. But if you're drunk, it all seems normal. So that's exactly what it was like. So that she's like, you got to really start with NDMA for most people. She's like, definitely for you, because that will help you clear out. First, it'll connect you to yourself and your emotions, help you start to feel them and help clear out a lot of the top layers of junk. And so that you can really start to do the work there. So I, I did, it took me four MDMA sessions before I stopped having somatic release, like physical, like shaking, you know, which is essentially, if you read uh, the book, the body keeps the score by Bessel van der Kirk, basically what that is, is stored up traumatic response, right? That's stored up a uh, somatic or um, like a fight or flight, right? A uh, fight, flight or freeze. And so four fucking sessions, halfway through the fifth session. Which are like five to six hours. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so that's, like, that's, it's that's like, like 30 hours of shaking. Dude, it's weeks. Of like, it's like, crazy. <laughs> it's like eight <laughs> generations that Seriously. you're trying to like get out, right? I, like, I was wondering if it wasn't past generation stuff. I don't think it was. I'm a sensitive dude and I dealt with a lot of stuff. So I just had a lot of stuff to get out. Halfway through my fifth session, I like I stopped. It's like it stopped. And it was like, oh, wow. And then I went through and had like a nor- quote normal MDMA session where like I thought about past relationships and people like all this stuff, the normal stuff people have <laughs> didn't have it until my fifth session. It was nuts. 
And so then the, she's like, okay, after you've, you've planted the bulb in the, in the right dirt, then the next medicine, generally you want to look at either mushrooms or LSD or both, right? Mm-hmm. Not, not usually combined, but uh, that's, you think of those two as like the stem. It's very dose dependent because if you do a bunch of mushrooms, that's fucking nuts, right? That's a lot. But if you're doing, you know, two and a half to three and a half grams of mushrooms is a good entry point. For most people, or like 50 to 150 micrograms of LSD, those are about equivalent ish. That's kind of the next step. I combined MDMA and LSD. They were amazing combinations. Mm-hmm. Dude, the LSD is rough, man. It shows you reality with no blinders and no bullshit. It's rough. Well, it's that clear crystal that just gets, <laughs> man. And it, you can't hide. It's like, here, look, yeah. look at this. And, but not. It's just weird. It's just very, very abrupt and rough. And so MDMA really helps smooth it out. That that was great combination for me. Mushrooms were great for me at breaking ego structures. Like I had to do eight and a half grams my second trip thing. Yeah, seriously, which is a lot. But it really kind of melted and then reset default mode network and all that. And so I did about a year. It took about eight months of MDMA. Then about a year or so of really just mushrooms and LSD. And then a lot of times what I would do is. MDMA in the morning and then mushrooms in the afternoon. I kept doing MDMA, but on a much more spread out schedule. I just had my last, uh, I did MDMA and LSD for the last time. Like I did my last big trauma session. Uh, It was about two years. And so I've gotten to the point now where my guides are like, okay, you're good to go. And so that's kind of the stem. She said is like the flower are like the higher medicines, right? Mm -hmm. Which would be like ayahuasca, 5-MeO DMT or DMT or those sorts of things, peyote, right? San Pedro, right, exactly. Yeah. San Pedro, uh, peyote. Those are really for mind expansion and exploration. Don't get me wrong. Plenty of people have used those medicines for trauma work. Mm-hmm. It's just very, very rough, mm-hmm. right? Or iboga or ibogaine. You use those for trauma work, you're going to get the shit kicked out of you. It's going to be really, really hard. And she said, "What, especially with ayahuasca, you will fall into a high, as a high risk of a spiritual bypass, which is where you keep going for the experience, but you don't really do the immigration work. Because MDMA and LSD, lower dose LSD and lower dose mushrooms kind of force integration work on you. Not totally. You can still avoid it with that stuff. And plenty of people do. But if you're really doing them right with good guides and therapeutically, you face your shit. Right? You're not going talking to space aliens and you're not living past lives and you're not doing the crazy mind exploration stuff. You're just sitting in your stuff working on it, right? Especially at the lower doses. And then once you've done that, like let's say you're one of those people who have no trauma, right? You still have all kinds of work to do, like on the higher medicines. It's just like the normal human soul work, like fear of death, uh, whatever your soul's purpose is for this life, all of that stuff. That's still waiting for you on the other side of trauma. And that's like, that's a whole life's work. So it's almost like, it's almost like uh, a lot of guys celebrate. I have a couple of buddies in the NFL, they're vets. And they're like, yeah, a lot of guys celebrate when they get drafted. I'm like, guys, this is just the start. Like all that work you did is just got you to the league, right? That's sort of the same thing. And so I'm October, I'm doing 5-MEO for the first time. I was supposed to do it about now, but then coronavirus and my guy can't travel and blah, 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 blah. So uh, I'm going to do it in October. That'll be my first flower medicine. But yeah, no, I see a lot of people who are like, oh, I'm going to go do 5-MeO DMT. And I'm like, have you done that? No, you know, I, I did some uh, Molly in college. It's like, oh man, that's, and then they're like, that was fucking crazy. I don't know. I'm like, yeah, well, I mean, it's like the first time you shoot a gun, taking a 50 caliber on top of it. <laughs> No, that's not where to start. That's how you do it. No, don't that's start how you there. Do well, and that's why I've like started. That's why even with third wave and a lot of the educational stuff that we've had, I focus so much on microdosing because it's like create a relationship with the substance, understand how you work with yeah. it. Like, that's even a better place to start is probably microdosing. Totally, because yeah. a lot of people have these peak experiences, these flowering experiences with ayahuasca and, and five meo, and they have no idea what to do. And it's sort of like what you said. It like especially with something like ayahuasca, ayahuasca in itself has this sort of like spirit and energy that comes with it. And so oftentimes she'll just blast through all the stuff and you'll just be left totally raw with no idea of how to integrate. And so a lot of people leave traumatized, even more traumatized than like how they went in. Whereas I think the beautiful part with MDMA, which you talked about in that, that medium piece, it's like there is literally no better substance that we have 
to deal with trauma? It's always your friend. It's so soft and gentle. Because that's the crazy thing about it is that like, it's almost a problem with it because someone like me, I have such good psychological defenses that like I can manipulate MDMA. Like I can, if I sit up and take off my eye mask, I can take the impact from a nine to a one, right? Which is like both good and bad. It's good because I've probably ha- helped at this point at least 50 maybe a hundred people do their first sessions. I haven't sat for them, but I mean, I've directed them to guides or whatever. And uh, a lot of my friends. And it's funny because like so many of them do the same thing I did, which is the first session, just talk and deflect and distract because it's your ego trying to keep you the same. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's why MDMA is both good and bad because like you take five grams of mushrooms, you're in. That's it. There's no, there's no counteract. You buy the ticket, there. you take the ride. That's you're what Dr. S. Thompson said. Yeah. The store is sealed. Exactly. But MDMA, you can essentially, you can pull your parachute, basic, mm-hmm. sort of. Like uh, you can get up, walk around, drink some coffee, and you're basically going to like, the, you can will the impact down very low which keeps people feeling safe. It's part of the thing. As you feel safer, you can lay down, you can relax more, you can let the hard stuff come up, and then it's all there to help you process it, right? It's such a beautiful introductory thing. You're probably right, though. For most people, microdosing, although I'll tell you, my experience, at least my friends, are more willing to do MDMA than microdosing. Mm. I don't know why, but like, I, I microdose. Microdosing is way... Dude, that, that's had a major impact. I mean, I just do... What do you, I do like 25 to 30 milligram or yeah, milligrams of mushrooms with I, it's stamina stack I got from you. It's like 200 milligrams of lion's mane, 300 milligrams of niacin. It's mm-hmm. fucking great, man. It's fantastic. And how do you use it? I like for the, the microdose that you in the morning. I just like, do you have an intent? Like, is it on writing days or is it on <laughs> writing never, days or you just sort of do it as like a two or three times a week thing? And you're no, like, this is a big thing where I diverge from. Not all the community, but a lot of the community, I don't believe in setting intention. At least with any of the medicines I've done or any of my work. I'm like I said, I'm only two years in. I've only done trauma work. I haven't done like uh, ayahuasca or anything like that. At least for me, what I've found is surrendering. I have one set intention, which is I'm going to surrender to the medicine and to the universe and um, let it guide me where I need to go and bring up what needs to be brought up. And that's it. Like I'm. Because surrendering is something that I'm always trying to be in control. And that, so I'll just let it go where it needs to go. Because right? I, I, I believe most of these substances, either they have an intelligence or you have an innate intelligence or both. Right? It's sort of the combination. Of that. Well, I mean, like, I'm not sure how much intelligence LSD has. Like, it, you mm. know, whereas like mushrooms clearly have an intelligence mm. and agenda. Like it, you can, God, they're so different than LSD. It's crazy the difference. Mm-hmm. Whereas LSD just seems like an amplifier to me. Like whatever comes up in me, it's like, okay, we're going to do that. And it's like, boom, and there it goes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely believe that there is a deep intelligence and that we're connected, obviously, energetically to everything around us and to something like a higher something, higher source. And so like um, I've learned that like the best I can do is just surrender to that and try and go with it. You know, instead of being like, okay, um, my intention today is, uh, it's not, some people love that. It just doesn't seem to work well for me because it gets me too much in control mode. I have the same thing. Like I don't really, I've set intentions or done some clarification like with journaling and self-reflection when it comes to the ayahuasca experiences that I've been into. But when I'm working with MDMA or even something like mushrooms or LSD, it's much more just like surrender, what happens, what happened. Don't try to control it too much. And for us sort of, intense type a men who are just like <laughs> yeah. like to have that release is where a lot of the healing is mm-hmm. to not feel like we always need to kind of control it and that's something we haven't talked about yet in the podcast which i want to get into which is like you know your story of healing right. which i think is so interesting I, I you know i first heard about your work because i was in a fraternity in college of course and you know we read i hope they serve beer in hell in the basement yep. and it, they, it was a fucking every time hilarious like everyone would just laugh their asses off and then I had probably like a year ago, 18 months ago, at some yeah. point, I like, I don't know how I found it, but I came upon, I think through a friend, sent me your medium post. Yeah. And I was like, that can't be the same guy. Tucker Max? Yeah, right. And so now like, I, I mentioned it to a few friends. I'm like, you know, like, oh yeah, Tucker Max. I'm interviewing for the podcast, right? He's like, that Tucker Max? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. that Tucker Max. Yeah. So like, 
Let's talk a little bit about who were you before psychedelics? What was going on there? And, and what did you learn from psychedelics that like helped to sort of heal a lot of that um, energy that you had before? So I did, I did 40 years of talk therapy before I did psychedelics. So I was in a different space than a lot of people. All like a psychoanalysis. So I was going four times a week. So it's like, it, it, you know, it was a decade for most people in therapy. I condensed into four years. So, like, I had a really good sense of myself. I had a good map of my brain and my emotions. The problem is I hadn't walked any of the territory, right? I hadn't felt any of it. And so, like, when I was writing all that stuff, I was both things. The things you read about in the book, all the stories are true. I was fun and funny and happy-go-lucky and out for a good time and partying and all that. That was all true. but like anything that is promiscuous and I don't even necessarily mean sex, sexual. I just mean anything that's that, that goes too far. It's done as a compensation for something else. And the compensation for me was like most people who drink and party and do all that stuff as an identity. It was a way for me to escape sadness, loneliness, pain, depression, to get rid of, to push away emotions I don't want to feel. Yeah, That's to, what it was, right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, and, and so, like, whether you are a named addict or you're, uh, like, a driven entrepreneur or you work relentlessly hard at your sport or you do what I did, anything you're doing as a distraction from emotions is going to come back and get you, right? I was in that space. And so the difference between me and most people is I was just able to write about it and got famous for it, but that's it. What I did and why I did it is no different from almost any, right? Like in any addiction, right? And I use the word addiction, not in a clinical sense, but any activity you use to distract yourself from emotions, let's say that, it eventually stops working. I amped it up for a while. It's like, oh, fucking one girl's week, week isn't enough. I'll, I'll two a week. And then one a day and two a day and blah, blah, whatever. Like, it's, okay, this isn't going to work. I can have a floor full of women. It's not going to stop, right? So it's not women. It's not drinking never really distracted me. It was drinking is just fun. Like, uh, I mean, it's, that's what's funny. People are like, how much do you drink? I'm like, really not that. I only drink socially. Like people come over to my house like, you don't have beer here? I'm like, no, why would I have beer in my house? <laughs> They're like, to drink. I'm like, I would drink when I go out. Why would I want to drink beer here? Beer's shitty. Yeah. Like, like I've never understood people who are like, oh, I, I guess I do. Uh, they drink to get drunk. I just would do it out. Anyway, so um, I just got tired of it, man. I got tired of it because I, I think subconsciously I realized it wasn't working anymore, right? And so then eventually, like, I started therapy. And therapy was great for a while. The problem with therapy is that it's all intellectual. It's all left side, you know, it's all talking, it's all thinking, it's all rationalizing, it's all logic. And those things all have a place in a human life and culture. They are not the only thing. And that's essentially, at least for me, all therapy was. There was very little emotion, very little feeling in it. I had parents who were terrible at being parents, who did not care about me, who never emotionally connected with me. So I had no idea how to feel. I, I, no one had ever modeled any of this stuff for me. And so it wasn't like my therapist did a bad job, right? Like uh, she did a perfectly fine job. She wasn't bad. She wasn't good. She was just a, 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 whatever, a solid therapist. But I just could not connect with these emotions in me. And so I eventually stopped therapy. And I tried a bunch of other stuff. And like, you know, yoga, which is like just shitty meditation combined with shitty exercise. Which I <laughs> Some people love yoga. Bless their hearts. I can't stand that. Like, meditation didn't work for me. But what's funny is meditation was working. And that's why I couldn't do it. Because I would stop and sit still and focus on my breath and then get flooded with these emotions. And I'm like, I'm, I'm going crazy. I'm not meditating right. No, I was doing it exactly right. I just didn't understand that's actually the point. I didn't have anyone around me who was explaining that, and I, I didn't have the... You just felt overwhelmed. Yeah, I, I, I didn't have the tools or capability to either understand or deal with meditation. It's funny, a buddy of mine who's very famous, like everyone who's listening would know his name, told me like maybe about four or five years before I did it my first time, he's like, you should really try mushrooms. And I was like... I remember I had a whole conversation with him about this. 
And it's like, um, thinking about it now, it's the strangest thing. It's like I couldn't hear him. Mm. Even though I remember the conversation, I remember him saying it. It was like, it's almost like remembering something I saw in a movie or a different person. or It did not connect with me at all. At all. And I, I understand now. It's just like, you know, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to feel. I wasn't ready to, to whatever. And then um, three, four years after that, my company did the book, Trust, Surrender, Receive. So Ann Other was a client of ours. And the guy who worked on the book did MDMA therapy. And I saw the change in him. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, what happened to you, dude, in the best way? And he's like, dude, MDMA therapy. And I'm like, no, bullshit. I'm like, come on. I'm not going to do drugs. He's like, trust me on this. He's like, and like, there was nothing he could have said. It was a combination of I was ready to start to feel my shit. And I saw the change. He didn't even try and convince me. When I was like, no, nah, he's like, okay, if you're not ready. And I was like, fuck you. No, you're supposed to sell me on this. Like, what's wrong with you? Like, you're not, like, I, I'm used to CrossFitters and vegans who are like, you have to join my cult, right? And people who do this work, for the most part, if they're doing it right, don't preach it. They just live it. And then people ask them, what happened to you? Right? Uh, and so I kept pastoring him. And so uh, he set me up with her and then we set up the thing. And, and then I was like, oh like, this is, this is it. It's so crazy, man. It's like, as soon as that shit hit my, whatever, cross the blood brain barrier, as soon as it hit me, I knew, I realized like the whole point of this is to feel our emotions. Mm -hmm. I had never really done that in my life. I had never felt true, real love in my life. Mm -hmm. and, and at that point, I had, I had a wife I loved. I had a son. My wife was pregnant with kid three, actually. I had a son and a daughter. And it's not like I didn't, I loved all of them as much as I could. I had grown up in such a dysfunctional, traumatic, toxic environment where no one loved themselves. And so it wasn't personal. Like it wasn't like they were happy elves and just beating me for fun. They were totally fucked up. And so they had no love to give me because they had none for themselves. You know, and uh, yeah, dude, that's the thing. And then, and the funny thing is, man, there's so many people like, oh, so you like disavow what you used to do? I'm like, no, fuck no, of course not. I had a great time. It was super fun. Of course, I did individual things that were totally fucked up. <laughs> and like, I absolutely apologize to the people who I wronged in certain ways or whatever. But in no way, shape or form do I disavow my past. Absolutely not. Like, I'm not going to curse the path that brought me here you know i'm pretty happy with where i am i'm pretty convinced i had to go through all that to learn the lessons i need that's another thing i got on one of my lsc sessions was like this is just gonna sound crazy but it's exactly what the medicine showed me apparently we pick our lives based on the lessons that we need to learn and the levels we have to evolve to and like i guess i picked this life and i picked a really hard childhood because I needed that in order to learn all these sorts of things. And I remember sitting there thinking, why the fuck would I pick this? It was like the realization was, and I don't know if this is like the medicine or the universe talking to me or my own brain, I have no idea. But it's like the realization was the only way you can evolve is going through trials, right? And so like the souls that want to evolve a lot pick the hardest trials. And I was like, Oh, that makes total sense. I get that. That makes total fucking sense. It sounds absolutely crazy. And then, by the way, then my friend's like, oh, you should read this book, The Celestine Prophecy. Have you heard of it? I'm like, that book sold 50 million copies in the 90s. Of course I've heard of it. I never read it. He's like, oh, he talks about all of this in the book. I'm like, no. Have you read that book, by the way? What's it called? The Celestine Prophecy? No. Oh, dude, it was super famous in the 90s. Was it? it? Was it was on the bestseller list for a decade. I was born in 1990, so okay. yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't. Yeah, it, I was it, still it was doing Teletubbies. At that point. It was on the bestseller list for for a decade, and it's crazy because no one talks about it now. This guy James Redfield, he's still alive. I'm going to see him in August in Sedona, but like he wrote a book that described all of this. By the way, doesn't mention any medicine. It's one of the things I want to talk to him about. It doesn't mention any medicine in it at all, but like a big part of the novel happens in Peru. I'm like, you had to have been taking ayahuasca, <laughs> obviously. Like, come on, man. Like, yeah. don't... No, like, all this stuff. Um, it's crazy. Once you start to look, it's like, oh, wow. People have been talking about 
not necessarily plant medicines, but the all the stuff you you understand on it. People have been talking about this for thousands of the Tibetans for thousands of years. And maybe they just got there through meditation. I don't know. Unlikely. I feel like we've had relationships with mushrooms and you know other psychoactive substances. I mean, like- that's what Terrence McKenna says, and his stuff's pretty persuasive, man. I'm a big fan of stone ape theory. The idea that humans developed higher levels of cognition through our relationship with psilocybin makes a lot of sense, especially when you do it. Yeah. Especially when you do it. It's like, before I did it, I was like, okay, this is interesting anthropologically. I get it. Wasn't persuaded. Then I did mushrooms. I was like, oh, of course. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. A hundred percent. Especially when you realize how your brain changes on it, mm-hmm. how different you are, mm-hmm. like how much smarter I am, mm-hmm. how much like more in tune with everything I am. Like I am so elevated is the only, at least relative to who I was, right? Not I'm saying it relative to anyone else. Like compared to who I was, it's like, it's crazy, man. It's like, you remember in Lord of the Rings, so the whole series, right? So remember when, like Gandalf takes him you know, through Moria and then the Balrog comes and he has to fight the Balrog and the Balrog pulls him down. And then Gandalf's gone for like the next movie. And then he shows back up and they're like, Gandalf, Gandalf. And he looks at him and he's like, that was my name once. I do seem to remember that. And like, he's like a different dude. And he kind of tells him the story and like, like he basically had to like die and, that's what I feel like, like me before medicine and me after. Like, I feel like Gandalf fighting the Balrog is like, like I remember all the stuff I used to do and who I used to be, but it feels like literally a different A life. different lifetime. <laughs> Seriously, man. Even though some of it's like only a few years ago. Like, it's like, oh yeah, no, I totally said that. I totally did that. I have no idea what I was thinking or why I would do Or even if I understand why, it's like, I don't know who that person is. <laughs> Well, it's going back to like what you had mentioned before, like you choose the trials that are most difficult. So if you're giving the examples like Gandalf and, and you know, the, the Balrog, yeah. the, the Balrog that yeah, gets him the by the, whip, yeah. yeah, with the bullwhip, it's like, that is such an intense example. And I feel like mythically when we play at those levels, when we're like choosing those trials and tribulations, right, then the level of transformation is mirrored in that. And I feel like, especially someone like you, you know, you've written what four New York Times bestsellers at this point. I mean, you have a, you have a company with dozens and dozens of employees. You just signed, which I think is amazing, Nassim Taleb to do his, his next book couple just books. Came out. Yeah. Did it? It just came out. Yeah, he's doing his others with us too, but he is, no, volume one, and it's two volumes, just came out last week. What's it called? Do you remember? Dude, it's his math book. It's called Statistical Consequences of Fat Tales or something. It's like this big. It's all the you don't want to you don't want to. Okay. <laughs> no, no. It's, it's I love all, Skin in the Game because Skin in the Game was like two hundred pages. Book. It's an amazing. No, it, it, it's all of the math behind all of his books. Uh, He's doing his, uh, that two volume set, and then I forget. He already told me what his next book is going to be or what he thinks it's about. He's doing all those with us. And so, like with that, right? You've gone through these trials and tribulations. You faced your demons. You've healed the trauma. You've planted the seed. The stem has start to grow. One you know. level of it. Yeah, there's yeah, still. Yeah. It's like an onion, dude. It's still happening. I'm, I'm only a few layers deep, dude. But you're. My point is, you know, you're a very powerful person, right? You know, and you've taken a lot of responsibility for that, and you have an incredible platform, and you have incredible influence. And I'd be really curious, just kind of as the the cherry on top of this interview, like. What's next for Tucker Max? Right? Yeah, it's, like, it's funny to hear you say that because in my mind, I feel like I haven't even fucking begun. Honestly, it's the weirdest thing. Part of this might be ego defense, right? But in a lot of ways, I had a session Sunday, right? Like literally three days, four ago. days ago, right? Three <laughs> days ago. And a big part of what came up there was like how I'm being afraid and holding myself back. Mm. You know, how like, and it's not necessarily shitting on anything I've done in the past. Like everything you said is true. Like I've done a bunch of bestsellers and I mean, our company is well into the eight figures and we have, you know, 50, whatever, full time and 170 part time and big office and blah, 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 blah. But like, um, I almost feel like, cause you know, we, we know, we know who we are, right? Especially you do this medicine, you know who you are. I know who I am. Right. And compared to who I am and what I know I can do, I feel like I've only just started. The God's honest truth is the thing I'm most afraid of, this is part of probably what's holding me back is actually the fear of it. The thing I'm most afraid of is not being who I, the full expression of myself. You know, I know I can do way more. And I don't mean that money necessarily. I don't mean it in fame or stature, although those things usually come. I mean it more of like, 
I don't know. It's hard to even describe, man. I just know like the full expression of me has only just begun, which is the craziest thing to think about, man. Like, like I'm sitting here thinking and in my mind, it's almost like I haven't done anything. And I don't mean that as to put anything down or whatever. It's just like, when you do enough of this and you do it, you take this work seriously, you feel, you feel the not unlimited potential. It's like you connect with the full power of the energy of the universe, you know? And it's like, Oh, like I'm not the full universe. I am part of that. Mm -hmm. And I can channel parts of that. And I can, you, I can, you do parts of that and sometimes shit for good or for bad right like I feel like almost like i've been a kid playing with legos and now it's time to go build an actual bridge or something you know i still feel that way it's the weirdest thing like it doesn't matter what i do i do something and it's cool and good and then i'm like okay well now i'm here what's the next like i want to evolve more you know it's sort of like the, the endless hero's journey cycles i finish one you come back, you're a different person, you start on another one, right? You're going in loops, but you're and you're ending at the same place, but not really. It's like an evolved place, you know? And so that that's what's the craziest thing is that like I'm 44. I honestly I had this thought Sunday. I honestly feel like thus far my life has been training for what my life will be for the next. Like, let's say, let's say about halfway through my life, right? Let's say I'll, I'll, I'll die between 85 and 90, probably, right? Maybe. I mean, we, we could figure out some. It's possible. Some, it's not unthinkable. You know, longevity tools of expansion. Uh, not not we'll unthinkable. See. But, but it, it's realistic to say that I have 30 to 40 more very productive years, mm -hmm. right? It's crazy. I think I honestly feel like I really felt like that this is just training. Like, I literally was like, okay, now you're ready to actually do your serious high level work, you know? A lot of the work that you had done before psychedelics, it wasn't from your soul. I mean, it was from your soul, but it wasn't that like... No, it was very clouded with, yeah. With it was very clouded with, with ego and with, with other things. And I wonder almost as if you feel like... I've stripped so much of that. Once away. all that stuff gets stripped away and cleaned away, then the greatest gift that you can give is going to come so, from yeah, that really right. I, clean I feel place. Like, yeah. and, and I feel like there's multiple ones. I don't know if it's just one. I don't know. I, we'll see. I honestly don't know. That's the only part that's difficult and scary is like, it's hard to explain. I feel like, like we're playing a game and the biggest part of the game is figuring out what the rules are. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And so like, and it specifically, it's like, if we're an energetic being having a physical experience, a huge part of our reason of being here is figuring out why did we choose this life? What's the goal? And the goal, I'm sure, is some sort of spiritual evolution, but what type? And how do we do it, you know? And not necessarily, like, I know how to write books or whatever, right? Because right now I have five, ten things in front of me I could be doing. And it's like, I don't know which one I'm supposed to do. Or maybe that's the point, is I'm supposed to pick one or the other, and that's part of the thing. I don't know, man. That's what's so fucking weird about this, is that, like, it's... You're playing a game where the main object of the game is that you have to figure out the rules. I had that feeling very clear. Two of my LSD sessions was like, I had the feeling that like, really, the reason you're here is to understand why you're here. And as soon as you get it, you can go. You get to evolve up. And like, I had this very distinct feeling that if I chose, I could just leave emotionally or spiritually, energetically. I mean, and then I was like, no, no, I don't want to leave my, my wife and my kids. Like, I like it here. It was the weirdest thing, man. I don't know, dude. Again, this all sounds like fucking kooky talk. If you, haven't, <laughs> if you haven't experienced this, there's just nothing. I don't know what to tell you. And it's we don't like verbal communication. It doesn't do it justice. Not even close. It's like 10%. Not even, of it. Hardly. I can't even think of a good metaphor to explain it. It's so different. It's well, so that's different. oftentimes what we can only rely on are like metaphors and analogies. There's no way to sort of like... I love the, the, there's an Alan Watts quote that goes something along the lines of like, you can always describe the hand or the finger, but you can never describe what the finger is pointing at. And that's sort of the, the ineffability of, of any mystical experience. Like that's the whole point of it. Yeah. It's to like get beyond this duel. Part of it is our brain. Like it just cannot handle certain realizations or thoughts. I felt it physically. I was just like, this is, it's like overtaxing my processor. 
Like it's too much for it to handle. And it frustrates me. It's like, I feel like I know my energetic being can know this, right? But my physical being can't or isn't going to, it drives me fucking nuts. I didn't know this before. I had to take this stuff, uh, these medicines, but like, and it's like, I can see it sometimes and I kind of get it, but like, I don't know. It's really hard to explain. Well, let's end on a high note, at least. Like, what are you most excited about right now? Like, oh, dude, like everything. <laughs> oh, no, very excited about everything. And like, no, there's no. Is there a project or like a collaboration or just like an idea or like, you know, are you working on your own call? Like, what's happening? <laughs> I don't know how you can do this stuff and not get excited. Like, exactly. some people don't. Okay. I don't know how you can do this. And because you do this and you realize, oh, like, I remember this pretty quickly that like, as much as I like this life and this existence, everything that we think is permanent and important is dust in the fucking wind. Mm -hmm. Like so very clearly. Mm -hmm. And like, and I mean right now, like literally cosmic dust and like, uh, like, I mean, I go through all the physics of it. Like here's the energy spectrum. We see that much. We feel even a smaller percentage, blah, 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 blah. Right. So like, it's all meaningless. And so that seems like nihilistic to a lot of people, but I think it's freeing where it's like, oh shit, we're playing a game. This is a game. And the object of the game is to figure out the object of the game. But then in the meantime, like do stuff that, that is fun and enjoyable and that makes the, the world better. Cause that's all yeah. drink good wine, have sex with your wife, play with your kids, create cool art, all that sort of stuff. Right. Like I'm excited about almost everything. The only time I'm, I'm not excited is I, of course, because I'm a human, man. I get stuck in oh, shit. I hope this business deal goes. I want, mm -hmm. the, you know, I still want things. I'm sure. still, I'm not. I'm definitely working on that. But like in terms of specific, like I said, it's funny you're interviewing me right now because I'm right now at a very deep inflection point. Like I literally just finished a bunch of projects, like mm -hmm. the one book I sent you, some mm -hmm. others. And I have this weird open spit the next two months, like, cause I'm not doing any medicine, nothing until 5 MEO. Uh, cause my last session wasn't that deep, the, the one Sunday, it was pretty light. And so like, uh, it's, I'm just going to rest and relax and it might even be three months, but two, three months, that's it. Nothing. And so like, uh, and create a space and see kind of what comes. But, um, I'll say this, we're at a very weird place in human history where it's clearly an inflection point, things are clearly going to change. Mm -hmm. I think it's very, very possible to make it through this and go into like an incredible golden age in our lifetimes. Like we'll probably be, uh, I'm a little bit older than you, so it'll, it'll be a few years, but it's more than capable for that to happen. Not, it's not a given mm -hmm. at all. It's not determined that way. At least I don't think, I don't know, who knows? Maybe it is. I just don't realize it. But, um, I don't think so because it seems to me at least one of the things I figured out in the medicine is that the whole reason we have this experience is choice, right? If choice doesn't exist, I don't think any of this would exist. That's the whole point of consciousness right. is seeing is seeing itself yourself and then choosing, right? So we have a choice to make. That's obviously frightening, but then exciting because like we get to make the world that we want. And so like, I'll tell you, man, like the only two things that I think really matter right now in the long run, everyone's bickering about bullshit. There's only two things that matter. The healing work that we're talking about with this, mm -hmm. and then the stories that we all decide to tell each other about our lives and ourselves, because that determines everything else. But that's how we negotiate reality as humans, is telling stories. And so like everything I do is gonna line up with one of those two things, if not both. I don't see myself getting into the medicines as a business. That's not my thing. But telling stories around that and around other things. Like if you're trying to create enough problems for a person to get them to something, what would mine be? And I think mine would be, how do you get someone to the point where they can see through bullshit, but at the same time, recognize how to help people. How do you see through other people's bullshit, but help other people create the frame where they can tell their story, you know? Because most people either know how to tell stories or they know how to call bullshit out. But very few people can do both, right? Because mm -hmm. like, like, look, everyone arguing now is like, do black lives matter? Do white lives matter? Does this, they're all arguing about stupid shit. It's and petty bullshit. Well, no one's telling a better story. The stories that are winning right now, for the most part, are toxic, destructive stories on either side. 
I'm not saying red or blue or no, fuck. They're both sides are being dominated by destructive, toxic stories. Right. So like, it's not so hard to see through those. Although most people don't, the hard part then is to tell a story that beats them. Right. Like the American story used to be, uh, the most power it was it was definitely the most powerful nation state story ever told without a doubt Mm -hmm. um at least it has been so far Mm -hmm. uh and and it was incredibly powerful for years it had fundamental flaws that eventually uh uh broke it and it's not working anymore Mm -hmm. right so what story replaces it right now nothing's replacing it in terms of like an actual life affirming positive story so you have everyone bickering about bullshit and then the smart people are like, no, no, uh, that's not what they like. They're arguing in the toxic frames instead of telling a different story, right? So you ask me, what am I going to do next? If I don't at least try to tell that story, whatever it is, I don't know what it is, or be part of the group and the team that, that helps form that story. It's not like it's all on me. Then I don't know what I'm doing, like because that's all that really matters. You know? Does that make sense? Makes sense. I'm still, like, you caught me at a weird time. I'm still trying to work it out myself. It's like the story of, you know, I love, um, you know, Charles Eisenstein? No. He wrote Sacred Economics. He talks a lot about the story of interconnectedness. Mm. And he says there's two stories that we've been going for, right? We've had the story of separation, Mm -hmm. which is this story that keeps bubbling up. Blue versus red, me versus you, you know, X versus Y, whatever. And we keep telling that story as if, like our culture is so used to it's embedded in our genes. It's just embedded into yes, us. And yes. so like a big process of evolution that we're going through is to like evolve out of that narrative to realize that the next stories that need to be st- told are the stories of coming together and the story of interconnectedness. So I think that, that to me like represents the cultural story of how do we transition from a story of separation? I am separate from nature. You know, I am separate from whatever, which just embodies disconnection. Yeah into the story of like, no, like we need to figure out how do we- Well, there's two parts. One is, is experiential, which is the medicine, right. right? And like I said, healing and storytelling. That's healing. Experiential part is a healing part. There's a story you could have told me, but I could not have heard a connected story until I'd experienced that. I, I just couldn't. I know myself. I couldn't have heard it. It's not possible. And I'm, I'm way smarter than most people. I'm way more likely to be behind that. Even I couldn't. So people have got to experience it first. What that story is, I don't know. The problem is our biology. The human physical organism is designed to be tribal, right? And to see the world as us versus them. So outside of an alien, right? Like that, that makes the story easy. <laughs> the story writes itself then. Outside of an alien encounter or experience, I'm not sure how to tell that story or how that story can be told. I'm not saying it can't. That's just a, a problem to be solved. With the experience of, oh, wow, I've done some of these medicines. I get it. Now I'm ready to hear that story. Have you ever heard of connecting this story that really worked? The closest I can think of is Christianity. Religion. Christianity. Well, and this is the thing. But religion. Like, the, what are the new religions of tomorrow? Like the big question that I've been going on is like, how do these new religions of tomorrow grow out of these intentional communities that are starting to pop up everywhere? So you've probably experienced as well, like all the yeah. people buying land in Costa Rica yeah. and, and like private islands and everything. I think we're going to see a big movement in the next 10 years, especially with the hollowing out of, of urban centers where people go, well, fuck that. I'm going to start my own city. So it's what we're, we're doing. We're buying a bunch of a big ranch in Texas and a bunch of families. And we're, we're going to be our own city state, but we're going to be in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a hundred percent, but that's the opposite of It's nodes of connectedness. It's like the mycelial network. It is exactly like that. And I think that's the best representation that we have of connectedness. It's, it's mushroom. Yes, it's true. Yeah. No, mushrooms are a very, very good example. But humans still need identity. Right, and so mushrooms don't have, don't need identity. Humans are complex. Lot to meditate on, huh? And so I'm telling you, man, <laughs> it, it's like no, seriously, it's like it's like we're trying to run 2020 programs on like a 386 or something, <laughs> man. It's too much. It's not undoable. It's just a lot, man. It's just a lot of a lot of bandwidth um, for a device that's not well optimized for that. Nope.
Well, thanks for coming on the show, Tucker. We're doing this again. My, my pleasure. Now we have part two of Tucker Mads. Yeah, we're going right. to weave it together with part one once yeah. we fix the audio. But no, I, I appreciate you opening up your home and having me over. And, of course. You know, like, like doing my this pleasure. It's been, it's been great to hang. Awesome. Yes. Thank you, brother. Totally.